in discussing the subject of the uh, of the Zoroastrian fire principle, uh, Pike also comes to certain conclusions that he regards as very important. He tells us, deriving much of his thinking from his own acquaintance with transcendental magic, he tells us that fire uh, is not only an, a symbol of deity, not only a symbol of purification, not only a symbol of light, not only a, an emblem of the sun, it is more than any and all of this. Fire is the symbol of the great chemical agent. Fire is the symbol of the power that works the great alchemical regeneration. Fire is actually, therefore, the tremendous agent, the master builder. Fire is represented in some legendary in the heroic figure of Tubal Cain the ironmonger, the man who is able to pound the swords into plowshares. Fire is the tempera of iron, and by means of it iron is hardened into steel, and from this steel is fashioned the sword Notong, the sword of the Valsunan. It is also the sword Excalibur the mysterious sacred emblem of the Arthurian cycle. And it is finally that sword of quick detachment, by means of which we are able to take the snaky branches of the banyan tree and cut them off, freeing ourselves from illusion. And it is also the sword of Damocles, hanging over the banquet of Dionysus of Syracuse, the hair uh, the sword suspended by a single hair which can fall and destroy a man. It is the two-edged sword coming out of the mouth of the great figure of Revelation. It is the sword, the golden blazing sword of the cherubs guarding the gates of Eden. This sword is a flame. This flame is itself a symbol of the great art the tremendous science by means of which all things passing through the fire are made new. There is a strange meaning. This fire is also the light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. This fire, which burns forever upon the altar of the human being, is the fire of life, the fire in the blood, the fire in the heart, which is truly the altar, the living altar of the soul. But this fire to Pike was a symbol by means of which he was convinced that the signatura rerum, the seal, the true signature of the great order which lay at the root of things was stamped upon the ancient peoples who worshipped it knowing why they worshipped, knowing the mystery of fire, knowing as the ancient Rosicrucians knew how to make fire burn in water, and how to make water feed fire as a fuel. That behind all of this was the statement of the science that later came into existence in alchemy, in hermetic philosophy, in Kabbalism, in Buddhism, in the Vedanta, in the yogic doctrines of Patanjali, the fire, this mysterious power, which if it be lifted up and subjected to the rules of science, will draw all things unto it. Therefore, that by the fire was now meant the operative mystery of truth. That while many things are speculative, the fire, by its own virtue and its own symbol, becomes the difference between the fire of truth and the cold light of intellect. That it becomes this, the power 
of the universe made available to man so that he may see in the night of his own ignorance. This fire man did not invent. He merely released it. The wisdom of the great ones of the earth man does not create. He releases it. It comes to his knowing because it is always present and becomes either the consumer of him or the enlightener of him. The great art then is that this fire must burn away the dross, that this fire must temper the weak metal, that this fire must be fed upon body until it becomes master of body, consuming all things that are not itself. This is then the mysterious fire of the Samadhi and the Nirvana of Buddhism. It is the symbol of the great art. It is a symbol of the science of human perfection. Pike gives us innumerable references to this and builds much of his symbolism upon the conviction that this is the basis. That without the true knowledge of the fire, man labors in vain. And that this fire, therefore, belongs peculiarly and wonderfully to the central core mystery of being that man began as the spark from the flame, that man actually first raised his altars to the fire, and whether he outwardly and intellectually knew it or not, he was stating the nearest thing to absolute truth that he was able to conceive at that time. And ever since then, he has been taking something away from it. He has never added to it, because he chose in the beginning perhaps the truest symbol that he could possibly have devised. Therefore, says Pike, we now have not simply a central geographical region surrounded by a group of peoples. We have a central psychographical quality represented now by the ever-burning fire. The fire which, according to legend, has never failed even though historically perhaps it has. But this fire is now surrounded by a series of other fires that have been lighted by its torch. And wherever this fire springs up, it seems to tell us that the one torch lit it. And this circumference of fires, gradually spreading on and on, like the mysterious campfires in the sky of the ancient Sioux warrior waiting for death, these fires going on have created roads or paths, because the way they traveled becomes a road for anyone who wishes to travel back. Consequently, in all parts of the world there is pilgrimage pilgrimage back to the father fountains, back to the parent fire. And around the fire is a wall, a great structure to protect the holy place, like the strange uh, walls around the tabernacle in the wilderness. Walls have been built to guard the sanctuary that the profane may not enter. And these walls, in Pike's thinking, are the walls of faiths, that they are not actually enemies of the fire, they are guardians. They stand uh, almost like armed cherubs, guarding the twelve gates to the holy land of truth. And these cherubs with flaming swords will not permit the uninitiated to enter in to the sacred ground. Therefore, these religions have gradually become systems of discipline. They have become ways of purification. They have become the pronaos of the temple, the outer part, the porch. And no one can enter the sanctuary who does not first pass through the porch to be challenged by the guardians like those who entered the ancient Egyptian mysteries. And unless they have the right word, unless they are able to prove their fitness to go on, the door does not open, and they remain outside. 
Only those who are permitted to pass these gates uh, have right of entry. Pike points out in 1878 that it's a little a pity that religions have not recognized this very significant point that they, like the flaming cherubs, are the guardians of something superior to them all. And that therefore, this idle controversy as to which one is the holiest among them is one of the worst wastes of time in history, and furthermore, the greatest cause of cruelty perhaps the world has ever known. Delta, the name of the fourth letter of the Greek alphabet. In form, it is a triangle and was considered by the ancient Egyptians a symbol of fire and also of God. In the Scottish and French systems and also that of the Knights Templar, the triangle or Delta is a symbol of the unspeakable name. And we go back a little farther, ladies and gentlemen. I-N-R-I. Jesus, Nazarenus Rex, Udiorum, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, the inscription which was placed upon the cross of the Savior. In the Philosophical Lodge, they represent fire, salt, sulfur, and mercury. In the system of the Rothacrucians, they had a similar use. Igni natura renovature integra, meaning literally, by fire, nature is perfectly renewed. This idea is also found in the degree of night's adepts of the eagle or of the sun. Remember, fires connected to delta. Remember that they burn their enemies to purify the soul so that the enemies will not come back after them.